بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome again to another episode of your weekly Islamic chat show Guest of the Week coming to you from Sharjah Television Sharjah Broadcasting Authority As always I'm your host Ismail Bullock And today inshallah we want to talk about a very very important topic which is the status and the importance of the Sunnah. And do that with me, inshallah, is no stranger to the show. Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalamu Rahmatullah. Jazakallah Khair for coming on. Wa Jazakallah Khair for having So, me. as I mentioned to the viewers, a very, very important topic which we're going to discuss today is the status or the importance of the Sunnah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Lahu Alhamdul Hassan, Wa Thala Ul Jameel, Wa Shadu Allah Ilaha Illa Allah, Wa Hadahu La Sharika Lah. يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. When a person wants to become a Muslim or they have to come with a testimony of لا إله إلا الله شهد لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد الرسول الله. Those are the two things that I mentioned the closest. Shadu la ilaha illallah, and right next to it is wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. So, so following the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and adhering to the sunnah, it's what wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah entails. It's what it means. Uh, if you think about it, for if the person was to come with ashadu an la ilaha illallah, I testify that there is no true God worthy which except Allah, but he doesn't testify that Muhammad rasulullah. He still hasn't done enough to become a believer. That's true. He That's must true. have that Muhammad Rasulullah. Naam, he has to come with both of them. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Walidhalik the scholars they say when the person says wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, it means ta'atu fi ma amar. That you obey the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that which he commanded you. Wa tasdiqu fi ma akhbar. And you believe him in everything he told you about. Wa ajtinabu ma naha anhu wa zajar. And you stay away from that which he prohibited you from, and that he told you to stay away from. And that Allah is not worshipped except in the way that He sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us. So the last one is what concerns us, which is we worship Allah wa ta'ala in the way that the Messenger did it. Alayhi salatu wasalam. The scholars they say, kulluha mastuda, illa tariqa tafa athara Muhammadin. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That all of the roads to Allah Azza wa Jalla are blocked The only road that you can take That will take you to Allah Azza wa Jalla Is the road that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took The path that he tread on There's no other road Because Ibadah is that which Allah loves and is pleased with That's what Ibadah is How do you know what Allah loves and is pleased with? The only way you can know is through the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's why when you look at the Qur'an and the, or the Qur'an, you find that it emphasizes on the concept of following the Sunnah, following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in many places in the Qur'an, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمُ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ If you love Allah Azza wa Jalla and your love for Allah is real and it's true, then the way to determine it is your following of the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the scholars, they call that verse Ayatul Imtihan. The verse of testing. Testing what? Testing a person's love. If it's real or if it's not. Or if a person wants to test his love of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Is it real? Is it really there? Then the way to determine it is to look at how his adherence is to the, towards the Sunnah. No. And uh, when you mentioned there are so many verses, and I can't remember, but I believe it's 20 odd something verses that say obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Sorry. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. So there's a, serious, there's a very big emphasis there. And we have um, people who pop up, and probably we're going to talk about that later on anyway, but people who pop up and say we just need the Qur'an. Everything in the Qur'an is enough. There's no need to look at any hadith. Sorry. But we continuously see Allah Himself in the Qur'an saying obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Whatever the Prophet you know, gave you or told you, take it. 
and whatever he forbids you from, stay away from it. So that itself is a very strong, strong evidence, strong proof that you need to listen to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, even if you look at the Quran, Allah Taala says, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul wa uli al-amri minkum." Those of you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. What's amazing is that Allah says, "Those of you who believe, obey Allah," and He didn't just say, or He didn't say, "Obey Allah and the Messenger," but it repeated the word "obey" again. It said, "Obey Allah," and then it said, "Obey the Messenger." Scholars, they said the wisdom in that is that the obedience of Allah is unrestricted. Also, the obedience of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is unrestricted. You obey him in everything, alayhi salatu salam. We obey him in everything he told us. We obey him in everything he prohibited us from. We obey him unrestrictedly. Whereas when it came to those who have authority over, over us, Allah says, "Wa ulil amri minkum." Those who have authority over you, whether it be your parents, whether their obedience is restricted to if it's in line with Allah and His Messenger. So this ayah really benefits us that the obedience of Allah is, is obeying the Messenger. If you want to obey Allah, obey the Messenger. وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولَ Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. They cannot be separated from one another. You know the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet he prohibited his companions from saying, إِذَا شَاءَ الله, If Allah wills, وَشَاءَ Muhammad, And Muhammad wills. The Prophet prohibited the companions from saying that. If Allah wills and Muhammad wills, they were prohibited from saying that. Because the will is only for Allah. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ الله. No one's will no, is Allah. Everything first is Allah Azza wa Jalla. The Mashi'ah is only attributed to Allah here. So the Prophet prohibited his companion, he said, don't use that well. He said, if you want to say it, say, إِذَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ If Allah wills, ثُمَّ شَاءَ Muhammad." If I remember correctly, he also added that, have you made me an equal with Allah? صحيح. So now we see that even in the statement, some, which may seem to some people be very simple, it's an interesting point to add, slightly off a topic, but relevant, is that even in this, just making a statement of, if Allah wills and Muhammad, and we see now people going and praying to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and asking him for things like they should ask Allah. Sahih. So if that was forbidden, just to make that statement, imagine making dua to him and turning your abada towards the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what a serious and big Sahih. mistake this is. If uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, have you made me an equal with Allah? Sahih. Just by the statement they made. Sahih. And he prohibited that. He said to his companions, لا تضروني كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم. لا تضروني. Don't go overboard with me. As the Christians went overboard with Isa ibn Maryam. فقولوا عني. Say about me, عبد الله ورسوله. Say that about me. But the reason I brought that up was when Allah says, وأطيع الله. Allah says, وأطيع الله ورسوله. Obey Allah and the Messenger. But the word was used here when it came to the obedience. But it wasn't used for the issue of Mashiach and the worship. Because obeying the Messenger is obeying Allah Azza wa Jalla. Both of them are the same in obedience. Because the Prophet doesn't speak from his own whims and desires. Um, I forget the, the, the full ayah, but there's the ayah that says, Min rasul faqad Allah. Whoever has obeyed the Sahih. Messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. Allah Azza wa Jalla. This it's is so also true. a very strong it's, it's emphasis definitely. to what you mentioned. 100%. Jazakallah khair. And it's true. And Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنُ يُوحَىٰ And he doesn't speak from his own whims and desires, Nabi Allah Muhammad. Everything which he says is a revelation from Allah. فَسُنَّةُ النَّبِيِّ وَحْيٌ ثَانٍ عَلَيْهِمَا قَدْ أُطْلِقَ الْوَحْيَانِ وَإِنَّمَا طَرِيقُهَا الْرِوَايَةِ فَافْتَقَرَ الْرَاوِي إِلَى الْدِرَايَةِ That the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is what? Is a second revelation. من عند الله عز وجل. It came from Allah عز وجل. Nowadays, as you mentioned before, there are those who want to say, you know what, the Quran is all we want. But are they really following the Quran? Are they adhering to the Quran? Because it's the Quran itself that's telling us what? To follow the Messenger. It's instructing us to follow the Messenger. I mean, how are you going to know how to pray? How, you, how do you know how to pray a dhuhr? How, how do you establish a prayer? How do you give zakat? Say good to the people. 
how do I say good? What good should I say? What should I not say? You, you wouldn't know those. Those verses are ambiguous. They need clarity. And that's what Allah said to the Prophet. Muhammad, we sent the revelation onto you. And the reason why Allah chose to send it down on the Messenger is so he can clarify it for the people. He can tell them what is it that he wants them to do and what is it that he wants them to stay away from. And one of the early things that happened within Islam when all the deviated groups came out is that they strayed away from this path following the Messenger one way or another. The first group that came out the first group that came out was the Khawarij. And when this group came out the first mistake that they fell short in was they didn't follow the Sunnah. They actually abandoned and stayed away from the Sunnah. وَلِذَلِكَ You know the famous story of Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها when the woman came to her and she said to her Aisha مَا بَالُ الْحَائِضِ Why is that the woman who's on her menstruation تَقْضِ الصَّوْمَ وَلَا تَقْضِ الصَّلَةِ Why is it that the woman who's on her menses تَقْضِ الصَّوْمَ She has to bring back the fasting وَلَا تَقْضِ الصَّلَةَ But she doesn't have to bring back the prayer. Aisha said to her, أَحَرُورِيَّةُ الْأَنْتِ Are you haruri? And the haruri were a group of the khawarij who ran away from Kufa and they went to a place called Harura in Iraq. He said, he said to him, he said to her, uh, Aisha said to her, Haruriyatul Anti, are you Haruri? Why did she say that? Because the Khawarij never took the Sunnah. So this woman, she might have abandoned the Sunnah and not wanted to take the Sunnah. So she wanted to know first. Something that comes to mind as well, that pe some people as well, they, they may not think they're abandoning the Sunnah, but they are in the sense of that they are starting to practice innovations for example mm. and uh, you can probably clarify the story but what pops to mind is the story of one of one of the sahaba and i believe it could have been ibn abbas but when he saw an individual who was praying so many rakaat every single day a certain fixed amount and he went to advise him and he told him this is innovation and he said to him will allah punish so he tried to be smart he said and we see this in modern day when you tell people this particular way of doing dhikr or this particular way of doing this is not from the sunnah. Sahih. They say things like, and this is what the man said to, to the companion, will Allah punish me mm. for making, uh, for praying? Mm. He said, no, Allah will not punish you for praying, but he will punish you for your opposing of the sunnah. Sahih. Sahih. So this is what we also see in modern times. Mm. Many people there will come back and say, come on brother, I'm making, mm. I'm making dhikr or I'm doing this. Allah will punish me for making dhikr. So he may not punish you for the dhikr itself, but the way you're doing it, you've made it up. Mm -hmm. It's not from mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. so the teacher of the Prophet Al-Imam Khatib al-Baghdadi mentions it in Kitab al-Faqih al-Mutafaqih, but he attributes it to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, the story, the Tabi'i. It's true, that's how it is. And what's amazing is, and Shaykh al-Albani mentioned it in Silsila Hadith al-Sahihah, it was amazing he said that, that Allah guided Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib to that statement to say, he said, Allah will Allah punish me? Uh, 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 Allah Is Allah going to punish me for a prayer I prayed? And he said, بل But Allah will punish you for opposing the sunnah. Just hold you on that point, inshallah, and we'll just go for a, for a short break. Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome back. Ustad Abdul Rahman, just before the break, we were talking about, and we, we, we ended on the point where uh, you said of Sayyid Musayyib, where he went to the man who was doing so many extra prayers, you know, in, in a way that's not from the Sunnah. And he mentioned, obviously, the man said, Will I be punished for, for my prayer? So you won't be punished for the prayer, but you'll be punished for doing it against the, you know, Sorry. you're opposing or you're going against the Sunnah. So that's, that's, that's where we ended off. Now, I'm so Sheikh Nasir, rahimahullah, Sheikh Nasir al-Din al he said something. He said that Allah guided subhanahu wa ta'ala to Sayyid al musayyib A statement like that, a statement really shows a lot of hikmah and wisdom in his, in his words and how he thought about the answer he's going to give. Sahih, Allah will punish you for prayer that you prayed, but you're opposing the sunnah. That's what you're going to be punished for. And something like that happened to 
Al Imam Malik, a man came to Al Imam Malik and he said to him, um, I want to do uh, Umrah from the uh, Qabr of the Prophet, I said, right next to the Prophet's grave. I want to come, I want to start from there, I want to wear my ihram from there, and then I'm going to go to the Miqat of the people of Medina, the Hulayfa, and then from the Hulayfa, I'm going to go Umrah. So Al Imam Malik said to him, La taf'al, don't do that. And then he said to him, I'm just going to increase a little, couple of distance. Really? Is that going to be a big problem? And then he said to him, Akhsha alayka al fitna. I fear fitna for you. And then he responded by saying, I'm, I'm just going to increase a couple of miles. That's, that's really it. What fitna could possibly come from this? And then he said to him, that the fitna that could come from this is you thinking that you can get closer to Allah. You can get closer to Allah in an action that the Prophet ﷺ didn't get closer to Allah with. And then Imam Malik has one powerful statement of his, which is, he said, Man ibtada'a fil islami bid'a'a yaraha hasana faqad za'aba anna muhammadan khana al-risala li'anna Allah ta'ala yaqul al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena fama lam yakun yawma idhin deenan fala yakun al-yawma deena. And Imam Malik said, anyone who innovates into this religion, they add something to the deen, Yaraha Hassan, he sees it to be something good. Fakat Zaba, that person has claimed Anna Muhammad and Khan al Risala, that the Messenger has deceived the message of Islam. Because Allah says in the Quran, Al Yom Akmal Tulakum Dinakum, today I have completed your religion unto you. Al Yom Akmal Tulakum Dinakum, Atmam Tulakum Nirmati, and I've fully established on you my blessing, and I have become pleased with Islam as your religion. And Imam Malik went on to say, Fama Lam Yakun Yoma Idin Dina. What wasn't a, the religion of Islam when the messenger was alive will not become a religion today. It's powerful that he said, The person innovates something into the religion. He sees it to be good. He thinks this is good. Wow, this is... And Imam Shafi has another statement which is, um, Anyone who see something to be good and says, wow, I need to do this because it seems to be good. He said he legislated. So the innovation starts very small. Khutwat. And then finally, what do you see? That it becomes very serious. I mean, look at the people Abdullah ibn Mas'ud entered onto who were just using the pebble. Mm. And one would say, Halilu bi'a, kabiru bi'a. That famous story. The narrator mentioned that those same individuals who Abdullah ibn Mas'ud rebuked were the ones who went against Ali ibn Talib uh, and became part of the group yeah. known as the Khawarij. Something that small. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطْوَاتِ shaytan. Don't follow the footsteps of shaytan. It starts off very small. You think it's just one innovation. It's just one small innovation I'm going to start. And then you can't stop it because you've now adapted yourself to opposing the Prophet. That doesn't, Shaitan won't just stop there. He will make you oppose him in more issues and then more issues. And then you start to oppose him in your mu'taqad, your belief, until you throw yourself into destruction. And any action that's not done in accordance to the Sunnah is rejected based on the hadith of the Prophet. Someone might say, the hadith says, Anyone who innovates into the religion, that which is not from it will be rejected. A person might say, I'm not the one who introduced it. It wasn't me. Someone else did it. And Imam al nawis it's amazing because right after that he put the other wording which is, Man amila amala laysa amununa mm -hmm. Just to refute that point, in case, it came, in case it comes to your mind. Which is anyone who does an action that's not from our affairs will be rejected as well. And the poet, he said, Hafid al-Hakami in his kitab, Sulam al-Usul, Ila ilm al-Usul, he said, uh, shartu, uh, he says, Shartu al-Sa'i, Shartu qabool al-Sa'i, Ay yajtabi'a fihi isabatun wa ikhlasun ma'a, Lillahi rabbil arshi la siwahu, Muwafiqan shar'i ladhi irtadahu. For an action to be accepted, two conditions are needed. Ikhlas al-Mutaba'a. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا It has to be in accordance to the sunnah and it also has to be done with sincerity. And that's another, that's another thing we see because 
Some people also claim, I'm doing this only for Allah. So they may do a certain action and they may truly be doing it only for Allah. But it's not enough because they're not doing it according to the Sunnah. To sunnah. And they could be doing something according to the Sunnah, but doing it to please people only. And then they're not fulfilling the first condition of doing it sincerely for Allah. So there has to be both of those conditions that's for it to be a valid and accepted act of worship. That's true. And that's the two things Allah rejects if a person doesn't come with. Ikhlas and mutaba'at al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa The shirk Allah told that he will not accept it if, it's, if any act is done upon shirk, Allah said, I'm not going to accept it. Ana aghna shuraka'i an shirk man ashraka ma'i ghayri taraktu wa shirka. Anyway, I am rich, Allah, the Prophet said, I am rich, I am not in need of being associated partners with me. Anyone who associates partners with me in an act, I will abandon him and the act and the person who he has associated me with. And the second one is, so he's rejected. You're going to be rejected. The person you're trying to do, all of it rejected. The second one is, um, of course, we mentioned the hadith, Man hadha ma laysa minhu It's rejected. And we, as Muslims, we want to go to Jannah. We want Allah to take us to Jannah. We want Allah to distance us from the hellfire. We want Allah to be pleased with us. There is nothing that's going to get us close to Jannah. And there is nothing that's going to distance us from the hellfire, except that it was clarified to us. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, مَا مِن نَبِيٍ بَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا كَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَدُلَّ أُمَّتَهُ عَلَىٰ خَيْرِ مَا يَعْلَمُهُ لَهُمْ that Allah did not send, subhanahu wa ta'ala, a prophet, a messenger. No prophet, no messenger came. Illa kana haqqan. It was a responsibility and it was obligatory upon that prophet. That he informs and he tells those people about any good that can take them closer to Allah. The Prophet said in the hadith, there is nothing. The first hadith I mentioned was in Sahih Muslim. The second, this one, I came across it in the Kitab Al-Risala to Imam Shafi'i And Ahmed Shakir in the Tahqiq of Al-Risala, he authenticated this. That there is nothing that brings you closer to Allah and that distances, distances you from Allah Azza wa Jalla, except that was clarified. So there isn't any act that you're trying to achieve, that you're trying to do Except that it has been explained if it's going to take us to Jannah or not. If your act is not being prescribed, is not being mentioned anywhere, I can reassure you, it definitely is not going to distance you from the hellfire. And definitely is not going to be pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. I guess what, what might be a good point to mention to the viewers here, because this comes up quite often, where, which may seem to many to be a very... Silly argument, but it does often pop up. Maybe we, you can shed some light on that. A lot of time when you speak to people, they come off with the literally statements like, why using a car then? Or why using a mobile phone? Or why using a microphone in the mosque when you lead the prayer? Or why using me megaphones to amplify the, the sound of the adhan? All of these are bid'ah. Mm. So how would how would one if one is trying to advise somebody and they come back with that? How would one reply to them? Would respond to them and and show them that those things is not what we're referring to here. Mm. The hadith that we mentioned, man ahaditha fi amrina, fi amrina means in our affairs, mean the religion. Anyone who introduces a matter in our religion, that's what the prophet said. Man ahaditha fi amrina hada ma leesa minhu. Fi amrina hadha means the sunnah, the religion, the deen. Anyone who adds anything to the religion. So no one's talking about the dunya. Rather the Prophet clearly and categorically said, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You guys know your dunya better. Go and innovate in the dunya and achieve and accumulate and make. The discussion is not about the dunya. The discussion is the, uh, the, the, the religion. Um, وَالْأَصْلُ فِي عَادَاتِنَا الْإِبَاحَةِ حَتَّى يَجِئَ صَارِفُ الْإِبَاحَةِ وَلَيْسَ مَشْرُوعًا مِنَ الْأُمُورِ غَيْرَ الَّذِي فِي شَرْعِنَا مَذْكُورِ The asal of our ibadat is our norms and our customs is permissibility as long as there doesn't come an evidence that diverts it from us. 
وليس مشروعا من الأمور. There is nothing that is permitted for us to do غير الذي في شرعنا مذكوري. Unless it's mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah. Unless it's stated in the Deen. Unless it's found in the Quran. Do you, one should never think to himself and become full of himself and can have some and be conceit to think to yourself that you can get closer to Allah or you can get to Jannah in an act that Nabi Muhammad didn't do. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, the scholars they say, If there was any door to Jannah, there was any door to, to, to be distanced from the hellfire, Wallahi Abu Bakr would not have, have, he would not have pulled back. Nabi Muhammad would definitely not withhold, withhold, he would not have withheld that information from his ummah. وَلِذَلِكَ Anyone who innovates in the religion and brings a matter into the religion or even does an innovation, the scholars, they said, his action speaks and says that Muhammad has deceived us. I mentioned the statement of Imam Malik. Because that person has claimed that Nabi Muhammad has deceived us. How is that the case? The scholars, they said, the way that, that that is, is because the religion is complete. Allah clearly said, Today I have completed your religion unto you. This is the 10th year of the Hijriah. It came down. The religion after that was complete. The scholars, they said, after that verse, no hukum, no jurisprudence rulings was sent down. Okay, it wasn't the last verse, because what taqwa yawma turja'una fihi lallahi was the last verse. But they said it was the last hukum based verse. That there was no hukum that came after that. There's no rulings that came after that. So after al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum came down. And Allah said, I am pleased with this for you. This is what I'm pleased with. Anyone who then adds something onto it has two options to either say the religion was not complete Allah is lying and that's a very serious issue statement to say or to say that Allah did complete the religion so the question is why are you doing this then because this is not what was mentioned in the religion you would be forced to say Nabi Muhammad deceived us he did not convey the message he was told to convey so that's the danger of innovating the danger the Messenger he warned us of this and he said to us عليكم بسنتي وسنة خلفاء الراشدين المهديين عليكم بسنتي وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين عضوا عليها بالنواجد وإياكم محدثات الأمور فإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة أنا نظر رواية للمام النسائي نويتد وكل ضلالة في النار that every newly invented matter is a misguidance and every misguidance is in the hellfire so the Prophet told us to stay away from innovation which is the opposite of following the sunnah okay i'll just hold you on that point inshallah please join us after this short break assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome back yeah we just we just ended on that very very important point of of uh, bid'ah, and if you practice this innovation, it's like you said. You're either saying that Abu Billah, or claiming that Allah is not making a statement of truth, or you're saying that the Prophet didn't didn't truly complete complete his message to to us. Now, in this last part of the show, something I think also co confuses some people is what can we class as the Sunnah. Because some people take it to an extreme where they read a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ used to wear a certain item of clothing and they then say that everybody must wear that certain amount of clothing. So you may say a group of Muslims, they say there's an evidence that the Prophet ﷺ would wear a long shirt with baggy trousers, for example, with a white imama. So then they say it is a must for everybody to dress exactly the same. Whether you're in the middle of, you know, the West or you're in, wherever you may be, everybody must wear that. So how can we define what is truly Sunnah? Now, what are the things that are Sunnah that we kind of must follow or what are the, and we're rewarded for? And what are the things that we, they're just out of a custom of Prophet them, out of preference? Mm -hmm. That we don't literally have to follow to the T. Mm -hmm. 
It's true. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the scholars, they mention that his actions are not all ibadah. There were some things that were jibili, was natural. This is how he was, alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, and there were things that were ibadah, that he did out of ibadah. Um, for instance, um, the Prophet's actions just show permissibility. If the Prophet does something, alayhi salatu wasalam, and there's no external evidence, okay, that makes it restricted to him alone, it shows the permissibility of us doing this. But it doesn't show that we have to follow him or we get rewarded for following him every time and every case. What I mean by that is, for instance, the Prophet وسلم, the way he walked and the way he talked, this is his natural way. It's not a ibadah. Allah created him like that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. His people and the culture that he was from, they used to do particular things and he would follow, those, follow them in those particular things. As long as he wasn't prohibited in, his, in the religion, he would follow them in it, alayhi salatu wasalam. Those are cultural things that he did. They were cultural things. They were adat of his people and taqaleed that he took from them. Also, it's not something that's a worship, that you get closer to Allah by doing it. One may then interject and say, well, what about the bid? Wasn't that the custom of the Arabs at that time? We'll say that you're right, but then a clear-cut statement came. Your argument would have stood, but he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let your beards grow, leave your beards. This now became a statement, and we need to distinguish between the statements and the actions. The statements of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the default position for it is shows obligation. The unrestricted commandments of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they, Al Amrul Mutlaq Yaqtadi Al Wujub. The unrestricted commands of the Prophet ﷺ shows obligation. So this, so this is, for the viewers, this is even a principle in Islamic jurisprudence, isn't it? Like the Al-Umr lil wujub that the, the command of the Prophet ﷺ is considered to be obligatory. Sahih. Just so the viewers understand that even for centuries going back from the famous scholars like the four Imams, etc., this is what was considered to be, uh, if there was a Hadith or the Prophet ﷺ that clearly was saying, do this, don't do this, Generally speaking, they would take that as a, as an obligation, it's true. or as a, something not being permissible as well. On the so, other flip, so, flip so, side, unless there comes an external evidence that removes it from it, or that shows that it's not obligatory. Um, uh, but yeah, sahih al amrul mutlaq. That's why I said the unrestricted commandments of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam shows obligation. Like if it's unrestricted, there's no other. Then we have to do that. We we have to do it. We have no choice uh, in this issue. Like the law and the rule of Allah is this. You have a choice if you want to do it. You can sin and commit, you know, disobedience. But you have no rights to now tamper with the hukum of Allah. But you're right. Some people, because they haven't understood how, uh, you know, the sunnah is and what is not the sunnah. And the definition of the sunnah. The scholars, they say the definition of the sunnah is مَا أُضِيفَ إِلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ فِعْلٍ أَوْ تَقْرِيرٍ أَوْ صِفَةُ خُلُقِيَّةٍ أَوْ خِلْقِيَّة it's five things they mention. They say number one, a sunnah generally is he's the prophet's speech, his actions, uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, the consent, things that were done in his presence um, that he approved of, alayhi salatu wasalam, his approval. And they also add into the sunnah his uh, manners and the way he carried himself, alayhi salatu wasalam. And last but not least, the way he, Allah created him. And that's the books of sunnah. When you read Shama'il al Muhammadi, it's a hadith book. This is what. Yeah. But we don't follow the Prophet in the way Allah created him. That's how he was. That's how he was. Um, I want to come back to a point that I think is very important to mention as well before the session is over. Is that the concept of rejecting the Sunnah. Or not giving the Sunnah any weight and saying, look, I just want to follow the Quran. That's what really matters to me. The rejection of the Sunnah occurs in two ways. There's a... Uh, a partial rejection. A person doesn't completely reject it, but there's a partial rejection. And they're the ones who say, I, we don't take single narrations in Aqidah. No, we don't want to take single narrations in Aqidah. That's one group of people. That is a form of rejection of the Sunnah. Because we were told to come, we were told to, alaykum bi sunnati, upon you is my Sunnah. Not the mutawatir one is upon you, and not the Upon you is my Sunnah. Unrestrictedly, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it like that. So this is in relation to people who, a, a hadith which is 
has singular narrator. Yeah. Uh, where pe some people say, oh, look, well, we do take hadith, but when it comes to matters of aqeedah, because they're so serious, according to what they claim, one narrator is not enough. Even though we have people like Umar ibn al-Khattab narrating some of these aqeedah-based hadith Sahih. in Arab'in and Nawawi, etc. So this is just so they, some, some of the viewers, the terminology mm. for mm. them. Mm. So this would be for those people who deny or what don't accept hadith in aqeedah narrated by one companion, for example. Sahih. Yeah, for example, you just gave one good example, which is Umar anhu, the hadith of Inna al amalu binyat. That hadith, Umar was the only one who narrated to us from the Prophet ﷺ. And the only person who narrated from Umar ibn Khattab is Al-Qamah ibn Abi Waqas al-Layfi. And the only person who narrated from Al-Qamah ibn Abi Waqas al-Layfi is Muhammad Ibrahim al-Taymi. And the only person who narrated from Muhammad Ibrahim al-Taymi is Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. And then the scholars, they say, after Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari, it became, it became 200 people narrated. Sufyan al-Thawri, Humaydi, Abdullahim al-Zubayr, Ibn Mubarak, Ibn Uyayna, al Numbers came. The point is like in... How many chapters does it enter? It like enters so many chapters of the religion. Mu'adh uh, ibn Jabal, the Prophet sent him alayhi salatu salam by himself and he said, Inna kan sata'ti qawman min ahl kitabi falyakun awwala ma tad'um falyakun awwala ma tad'um ilayhi shahadatu an la ilaha illallah. One man. So that's one form of rejection of the sunnah. But it's partial rejection. And it's a stepping stone to the complete rejection. It's going to come to that finally. The second one is the complete and ultimate rejection. The person just doesn't take the sunnah. And they call themselves unjustly. And it, sh it shouldn't be allowed to, for them to be called this uh, Qur'aniyun, they call themselves. This is what Qur'aniyun. No, they're not Qur'aniyun. Because if you follow the Qur'an, the Qur'an told you to follow the sunnah. What you should be called is Munkiri as sunnah the rejectors of the sunnah. That's the real name that should be given to you. The rejectors of the sunnah. But they call themselves Qur'aniyun. So you mentioned the uh, people they call themselves Qur'aniyun. So obviously, you know, you mentioned if they really were Qur'aniyun, followers of the Qur'an, they no doubt would have to accept Sunnah. the Sunnah. Because we mentioned earlier, pointless areas and pointless parts where the Qur'an keeps pointing continuously to obeying Allah and obeying the Messenger. Say to the Prophet ﷺ, we have sent you with the wisdom to make clarity and show the people the meanings. Whoever has obeyed the Prophet Sallallahu has obeyed Allah. Continuous of verses. So if they were truly the followers of the Qur'an, they would have to, no doubt, be following the Sunnah. No doubt. And the, the Qur'an actually pointed us. I mean, there are many ibadat that are connected to following the uh, Sunnah. Like when the Prophet Sallallahu stood up on the pulpit and he said to the people, uh, See the way that you pray the the pray the way you see me pray. Take from me your hajj. The one who just follows the Quran will not be able to do that. The one who follows the Quran uh, and just only sticks to the Quran, he or she will not be able to do hajj. So all of that is found in the Sunnah. All the, all the finer exp exp explanatory details, all just like for the salah, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. and how to give zakah, etc. All of this is with, within the, within within the, the, the hadith that, these pe that people, Sorry. unfortunately, deny. And it's within the, within the sunnah that a person learns how to, and, you know, how to care for, 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 for the neighbours. You know, how, how the Prophet did it, والسلام, how to treat your wives. Allah says, بالمعروف, live with them in good. That's all it said. How is that good? How is it determined? All of that is more explained in the Sunnah. And that's what Allah sent him, the Prophet والسلام, for us, so we can learn these things from him. That we can learn from him, والسلام, how to do things. Um, the Prophet, والسلام, his Sunnah, and the way that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah was, was the most beneficial thing for us. The thing that will bring us to Allah Azza wa Jalla. The thing that will protect us from the hellfire. The Prophet said in the hadith, Kullu ummati yadkhuluna al-jannata illa man adha. All of my ummah will enter jannah except the one who rejects. The sahaba, they said, Qila wa man ya'ba ya Rasulullah. Who are the ones who are going to reject it? Who are the ones? 
who are going to reject enter Jannah. Who would say that I don't want to go to Jannah? Because Jannah is ma'ala ayinul ra'at wa la udhun sami'at wa la khatar ala qalbi bashar. Who is the person who's going to say I don't want to enter Jannah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, man ata'ani dakhal al-jannah wa man asani faqad aba. The one who obeys me will enter Jannah. And the one who disobeys me is the one who refused. You know, he doesn't want to enter Jannah. I think that's a really good, really good point to end on that, inshallah. And thank you for, inshallah, for all tuning in. And inshallah, same time, same place. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.